Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, this is one of the last lectures of this unit for uh, biodiversity and we're going to be talking about ecosystem disturbances and ecological succession. So let's start with the song. I had a request to play Frank Ocean, so this one's for Michaela. Enjoy. I thought that I was dreaming when you said you loved me. The start of nothing, I had no chance to prepare. I couldn't see you coming. The start of nothing, ooh, I could hit you now. It's quite alright to hit me now. When we both know that deep down, the feelings that are deep down is good. I love Frank Ocean. All right, so let's get started. Uh, that was Ivy by Frank Ocean off of his latest album. Uh, hopefully he comes out with new music soon because I'm ready. Um, so some key terms that you must know for this uh, lecture are ecosystem resilience, ecosystem resistance, primary succession and secondary succession, climax community, and keystone species. And it will also be helpful to review the limiting factor or limiting nutrient vocabulary and range of tolerance, which were in my last lecture. So we're gonna talk about disturbances today. So my first question to you was, what are some natural disturbances that can impact ecosystems? So just take a second and think about it. And now I'm gonna give you some answers. So things like fires, forest fires have great impacts on ecosystems. Hurricanes like we just saw in the Bahamas and we've seen with Sandy and many other very powerful hurricanes can destroy ecosystems. And things like drought can also cause quite a bit of damage to areas that aren't necessarily prepared for it or where drought is severely strong. Um, but are there any other types of disturbances that I'm leaving out? Of course, there's the, the human-caused disturbances or the anthropogenic disturbances, and that word just means things caused by humans. Um, and those are things like uh, agriculture, so we destroy a lot of land to create these massive farms to grow our crops and to feed our animals, so agriculture can be really destructive. Uh, I actually talked about this with, I think, Kevin in one of my classes, but uh, we actually kind of take the tops off of mountains to mine coal. So what you're seeing here is the very top of a mountain that's just been kind of opened up, basically, and that takes away pretty much all the life that's there. Um, and we do that for coal mining. Things like, obviously, building houses are very destructive to natural ecosystems. And uh, clear cutting or deforestation, as we talked about last week. So uh, we're going to get into how ecosystems kind of set themselves up to be prepared for these sorts of things. So we'll first talk about ecosystem resistance, and that's the ability of an ecosystem to remain unchanged when subjected to a disturbance. So places like the Sahara Desert are constantly being disturbed by this like absolute lack of, of moisture and the extreme heat. And so they're able to resist to a certain extent that, that um, ongoing heat that they're exposed to. Uh, ecosystem resilience is the ability and rate of an ecosystem to recover from a disturbance and return to its pre-disturbed state. And we're going to get more into that in just a bit. There's something called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis that kind of goes against what you would think, but it's basically this idea that ecosystems experiencing intermediate or medium levels of disturbances are actually more diverse than those kinds of ecosystems with high or low disturbance levels. And that actually makes sense when you think about it, because if there's not a lot of disturbance, like you see here in the graph, then egos or certain species in an ecosystem can become kind of dominant and others struggle to survive when there's nothing going wrong. There's no kind of struggle to stay alive. There's one species that will take over and the others will, stop, will struggle. When you have a really high intensity of disturbances, obviously, it's hard for everybody to survive. So being in the middle is actually kind of helpful. So that's why some disturbances are good and some are bad. But um, if you're having in your ecosystem, if you experience disturbances at a medium rate, you actually have a higher species richness, meaning more species are able to survive and thrive. So now we're going to talk about succession. Um, and succession is really just this predictable replacement of one group of species by another group over time. And you can see that in nature. And also the example I'm giving you here is, is we have that with music. Every every so often we have this kind of replacement of old groups with new groups and it keeps going on and on and on. You can kind of predict it. Like eventually uh, there will be changes to what's 
currently cool and modern. So we had Boys to Men and Backstreet Boys, and they became things like Amigos and One Direction. And even though then we're still, you know, having replacements to those groups, and they're always changing. Over time, it's slow, but eventually everything kind of has a replacement. <laughs> so the first kind of success succession we're going to talk about is primary succession, and that begins in a place without any soil. There's no uh, like chance of life. It's just rocks. Um, so like you see here, you just have these uh, like sides of a rock here, um, or also in a place like a, a volcano, the side of a volcano, which you're seeing here. Um, and this can occur when there's flooding, when there's landslides, um, when a volcano erupts, primary succession can occur. But again, it's in a place with no soil. So the very beginning of succession is right here, where you just have bare rock. The second step to primary succession is uh, the arrival of an airborne pioneer species, such as a lichen. And they do not need any soil to survive. These here are lichen, and they can just live on rocks. So again, the kind of second step is that a pioneer species like lichen will come into that environment, the bare rock, kind of latch on and start to thrive. So a pioneer species is any species that can colonize a new area really rapidly and they can grow really well in full sunshine because there's nothing else there. It's just rock and sun. So things like lichen uh, will do that for you. They're pioneer species. So this is our second step in succession. That's pioneer species is going to come in. Then you have steps three and four, where soil starts to form as the lichen and weather, weathering uh, and erosion help to break down rocks into smaller pieces. And if you think about this, this is an incredibly slow process. It's not happening overnight, but slowly rock and lichen will start to break down to form soil. And then when lichen die, they decompose and they add small bits of organic matter to the rocks to make that really nice soil that other things will grow from. Okay, so that's what we have right here. Decomposition creates that, that first layer of soil. So that's steps three and four. And then once you have soil, simple plants like moss and ferns, ferns are here, moss are here, they can grow in that nice new soil. So that's, sorry, so step five. Right here, grasses and, and simple things will be able to grow, and they actually end up replacing that pioneer species. The lichen are gone, the grass, the ferns, the moss can live. Um, once those simple plants start to die, they add more organic material to the soil, the soil begins to get thicker, and things like grass and wildflowers and other plants can take over. So that's kind of the same as step uh, five, but we're kind of stepping into this area as well. So as your soil starts to grow uh, and, and get thicker, more things are able to grow. Uh, once those plants die, they continue to thicken that soil, add more nutrients, and things like shrubs and trees. Sorry type of trees can survive. So that's a uh, step eight and nine right here. Shrubs and trees are able to grow once that soil is extra, soil is extra thick. Um, so that's getting a little more complex. And then you get to that final stage where you have insects, birds, mammals, they, they start to move in. And once you started with bare rock and now you have this thriving ecosystem where all sorts of different animals are able to thrive. Insects and, and plant life, it's, it's a full grown ecosystem when you started with bare rock. So this is the process of primary succession. And you might remember this from bio, but I hope you spend some time kind of thinking about it and just remember primary succession occurs with bare rock. There's no life to begin with. <laughs> so there's another kind of succession and that's known as secondary succession. It's a little bit different than primary for a couple of reasons. Um, the first and most important is that it occurs in a place that already has soil. Primary succession was in a place that was rocks or the side of a volcano. There's nothing. Uh, secondary succession has soil and was once home to many living organisms. So it's somewhere where there was once life, something bad happens, and there's no life. And because of this, it occurs a lot faster than primary succession because there kind of already was uh, life to work with before. And it has different pioneer species than primary succession because it's not lichen that need to form on bare rocks, it's uh, seeds that get carried over from different islands that can form in the soil that's already there. So that's a key difference as well. Um, and a common example of secondary succession is after forest fires. Um, so once a forest fire comes and burns down this whole ecosystem, it will leave some of that soil, leave some seeds and stuff so that the ecosystem can grow 
and become healthy again. And this does take time, but it is a little bit faster than primary succession. So when you get to that kind of final stage of succession, you're at what's called the climax community. Oh, no. <laughs> Which is a stable group of plants and animals that kind of end the process of succession. But a uh, climax community is not always this beautiful forest that you see here. It can look like a, a bunch of different things like just grasses and a prairie, the desert, and even a coral reef. So these are all healthy ecosystems that are in their climax community stage. They have grown from some sort of disturbance and they have all the species that are able to survive in this area. So these are all different examples of climax communities, not just a beautiful forest. There's many different forms. There's a couple more key pieces of vocabulary. One is called an indicator species. Um, and these species give early warning signs of some sort of damage or danger to a community or an ecosystem. So if you look at a river and there's no trout, which is a type of fish, in an area there with like kind of the, the qualities or the range of tolerance that trout can live in, like good temperatures, good area, space, whatever, and you see that there's no, actually no fish there, there's no trout, that can indicate that something is wrong with that river. The water quality is poor, something has been polluted into that river, so if you examine it and you see that a species isn't there, that can tell you something is wrong with that area. Uh, some other common indicator species are birds, butterflies, and amphibians. Amphibians can indicate for land and water because they live in both land and water. So if they're not there, or if they're dying out, that's usually indication that there's some sort of danger or damage to an, an ecosystem. Animals are so cool, they tell us so much. Uh, there's something else called a keystone species. And these are really just think of them as like the, the king, the, 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 the most important, not really, but they have an incredible impact on a community so much so that if they're removed or if they're taken out, uh, serious things happen. They, 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 they're missed way more than other species if they're taken out of an ecosystem. They're the key. Um, and why are they so important? They might help with pollination, they might be a top predator that kind of keeps the food chain in balance, and they might help with decomposition. So keep these things in mind. Um, so what happens when you lose a keystone species? So many things. Uh, your whole food web can be disrupted. Like imagine if you lose your top predator, then everything in that food web is altered. Uh, populations can decline and things can even go extinct. So the keystone species is incredibly important. It's key to maintaining a healthy ecosystem. Um, a couple examples of keystone species are sea otters. Actually, not that you'd really imagine that, but they're really important because they eat sea urchins, which are these little guys here. They're really pokey. Um, which controls sea urchin populations. And urchins are actually really bad. They would destroy kelp, or like seaweed kind of. They would destroy the kelp habitat. Um, and kelp is important to any, any water ecosystem because it's a producer, it's a plant. And it feeds and shelters many, many different organisms in an ecosystem. So if you lose the kelp, you lose pretty much the, the main producer in that ecosystem. Everything kind of dies. And also bees, sorry, bees are pollinators. Uh, they, they help provide plants with the, what they need to reproduce, keep themselves alive. And if you don't have plants, if you don't have flowers being able to grow, you're, you're gonna suffer as an ecosystem. So bees help keep ecosystems healthy and alive. And uh, one of my favorite, not favorite movies, but I loved the bee movie before it became a joke, but it actually tackles this kind of concept of the keystone species. It highlights how important bees are as weird as it is, it really does kind of tackle this idea that you take away the bees, what happens? So if you have some free time, watch the bee movie and kind of connect it to how bees are a keystone species. So extra credit would be to think of another keystone species. And there's actually one in our classroom right now. Uh, it's not us. And explain why they're so valuable to an ecosystem. So don't copy this from Google. Put it into your own words. I will know if it's taken from Google. Think of a keystone species and explain why they're so valuable. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, let me know if you want a specific song. I probably won't play it unless it's good. Okay, bye y'all.